Give me just a sec, everyone. Okay. Okay. So, hello, everybody. It's been a while. I have been very, very busy. Which means I've not had a lot of time to do the stream. Hey, Nathaniel. But yes, I have been very busy. Last weekend I was at some union training and stuff like that, which meant I did not have the time to do anything. So, what we're going to do today is just a very short stream, because it is very warm here in the south of England. My brain is frying under the extreme heat. I do not do well in the heat. I am sensitive to it. So, yes, this will not be a long one. Okay, what are we going to do today? What are we going to talk about today? What are we going to talk about today is the Eternalist. This is our version of the Cleric. We will do a quick overview of what we've done with the Cleric. And then we will... Uh, do some work on some subclasses for the cleric because I am struggling uh, I know what I want to do it's just working out what they actually do it'll make sense when we get there so yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only person so yeah a uh, key thing about an eternal compared to a eternalist compared to a cleric so a cleric is very strict. You follow a god. In theory, there are other bits where the book goes, oh, you can follow a philosophy or a concept. But it's very much about religion. An eternalist serves an eternal. And et an eternal is any entity that has faith. Which can be religion. It can be a philosophy or a creed or a concept, as long as you have faith. But also, in theory, you could have your eldritch horror. It's not a god, it's something else that doesn't follow the laws of the universe, but you still give faith to it, so it could be an eternal. Um... And the key difference between them and a warlock is a warlock is powered by a pact they make with an entity. An eternalist gives faith to the eternal and receives some of that power of the eternal back as a reward. So one's more transactional, one's more powered by belief and faith. It's a slight difference, but it does mean there is some times where you would be an eternalist where you couldn't be a cleric. So, I'll see you spell slots, cantrips, usual stuff, d8 hit die, light armor, medium armor, simple weapons, you get three skits. Nice, simple, easy. Then we immediately get into something that doesn't operate like a normal... So, the Eternalist is heavily influenced by what your Eternal is. So I'm actually going to jump to the end of the class doc to an Eternal. You need to build your Eternal. You need to build... Now, it could be that your Game Master goes... I have a world, I have religions already set up, these are the Eternals. And this is already done for you, and you just pick one as a player. But it could be you're in a setting where maybe you want to give faith to something that doesn't quite fit what your GM nor had pre-prepared and it's like, okay, I'll let you design this or maybe you're in a more sandbox setting. 
at which point you've got to build your eternal. So the first thing you need to do is you need to determine, because it determines a number of functions, if it's a concept or philosophy, a single deity or a pantheon, a deity in a pantheon. There are other things it could be, but kind of you, you find which of those three options is the closest facsimile for what you want to your eternal to be. You then go give it a name. You then pick the eternal domain, you go through the domain listed, and you pick a primary domain. Um, the way to view it is, say there were a deity, you would go, uh, Thor is the god of thunder, Loki is the god of trickery, um, Hephaestus is the god of creation. Uh, deities deities aphrodite is the goddess of love you, you get the idea what is if you were to go oh that eternal they're the thing of x what is that x and that's their primary domain then you have adjacent domains which are other domains that come under their purview you then if they are in a pantheon will select two deities to be adjacent so the way to look at it is what two deities are relationship wise concept wise closest to your eternal no matter which type of eternal you picked you pick one damage type considering the themes which is the associated damage type of the eternal there is a reason to pick it a nemesis and a chosen creature type so if you want a default, you would always go humanoid. But in theory, say you had a eternal of the wild, where you would go with animal as the chosen creature type. And it might be that their nemesis are constructs because they do not like the machine. Uh, if you had a deity to do with death, who who believes that things should die at their associated time it might be their chosen is humanoids and it might be their nemesis is undead uh a deity of dragons uh could go dragons are my chosen deity uh, my chosen creature type i don't know other dragons might also be the nemesis maybe there's a division in dragons and so you, it's the same creature type uh it It'd be entirely up to the story of your eternal. And then you would pick at least three of the channel faith actions listed here to be associated with your eternal. Um, so these operate like channel divinity. We'll get into it when we see the main thing. But the ones are banish nemesis. So it's a bit like turn, except in this case you're banishing them. The key thing is, it will only work if that entity is on a diff, on a plane of existence that isn't its home plane. So this one's a bit more niche. A uh, superior channel, which lets you... Um, Oh, yeah. So uh, the reason for superior channel is partway through your channel abilities getting improvements. Everything gets a buff when you unlock superior channel. Uh, so for banish, it also does some damage. Uh, channel power is you can modify a spell to do your cho eternal's chosen damage type. So say, for example, you had a eternal of thunder. Let's say Thor was your eternal. You had eternal of thunder, Thor. And you picked a domain that likes doing uh, a domain that has a special ability that goes you do more lightning damage. I've no idea. I've not read this domain, but I'm just spitballing here. Or you have a deity associated with fire. You can choose any damage type. We're just gonna go with thunder right now because Thor's on my mind. Um, Thor. So lightning, thunder. You get a buff if you do that damage. But you want to cast Fireball, because Fireball is a really cool spell. So you cast Fireball, or you would use Channel Power to change the damage type of that thing to Thunder. Uh, you have to change the damage type to your deity's chosen damage type. 
So you can effectively with this kind of reflavor certain spells to definitely fit more with your eternal. Uh, convert to power is basically use your channel faith to give you some spell slots. Uh, create or banish darkness is either you create an area of darkness or you banish darkness, you, you emit a light. Um, harm foe, nice, simple, easy. You could just use your channel divinity, your channel faith to uh, deal some damage. Empower allies, you can give people uh, some damage reduction. These tend to also get an additional buff if the target is of a chosen or nemesis creature type. Uh, manifest power is... Oh yeah, you basically get a damage buff equal to your... You get a damage buff based off the type of damage your eternal deals. Preserve allies is healing. Rebuke target is... Which one's rebuke? Oh, that one's where you charm people. And then weaken foe is... Yeah, you, you make them susceptible to damage of your Eternal's damage type. And the reason this is important is uh, for the class features we're about to see. Um, so that was designing an Eternal, and it becomes important because at level 1 you do need an Eternal you're devoted to. Also, your relationship with the Eternal is slightly higher than a normal person who follows that Eternal. Because you have basically gone, my class is dedicated to you. And you get your domain. So spell casting, it's the Eternal spell list. You, you use a Eternal magic, it's using your intuition. You get a ritual cast. You get your domain spells, which are basically bonus prepared spells. Much the same as a cleric's prepared spell list. Every class tends to, that has spell casting can modify the bolt spell associated with that spell list. So for Eternalists and Oathbound, you have the Eternal Bolt, which does radiant or necrotic damage, and you pick when you deal the damage. The key thing for the Eternalist is you modify the spell. The spell is altered by you gaining this class. You have to prepare the spell, you don't get it for free, but if you take the Eternal Bolt cantrip, you can now pick between Radiant, Necrotic, or the damage type associated with your Eternal. So if you've got an Eternal that deals Necrotic or Radiant damage, nothing changes, but say you're doing Fire, Lightning, stuff like that, it, it will have an effect. Then you have Channel Faith, this works very similar to Channel Divinity. You get three Channel Faith options when you gain this feature. You get a Chosen, Turn Nemesis, and then you get to pick one of the three, at least three, that your Eternal provides. So a Chosen is very simple. You get to heal a target of your Eternal's chosen creature type. And then turn Nemesis is it's turn undead, but now it affects whatever creature type is against your deity. So if you have if you're following an Eternal that likes undead, no longer can you get an ability to turn the things that your deity likes. Now you can only ever turn the thing that your deity despises. So that's channel faith. Then you also get a second level path of faith. So you get to pick which kind of path do you want to go down as an eternalist. And you get to pick the path of battle. Uh, this is you get proficiency in martial weapons and heavy armor. You're, you're going to go fighting. The path of hearing is you are someone who is going down the more oracle route. You hear the words of your eternal and you speak them to the world. So you gain the right of hearing. And 
it may be that an eternal or their servants choose at particular moments to deliver a message through you and you could decide to use your own voice or the entity's voice um you can have an eternal that hates dragons if you like you could have an eternal that hates any creature type you could have an eternal that hates humanoids which would be rather unfortunate if you're playing a humanoid you could be an well actually no because you could be an ooze you could be an ooze eternalist whose chosen creature type is oozes and nemesis creature type is humanoids and you can go about healing oozes and hurting hum turning and frightening humanoids if you so wished then you have the path of knowledge which is you get skills you get to master some skills path of magic is you get additional spells path of ritual is you specifically gain new spells but they are ritual spells and you gain an additional right then at third level you um yeah so this is where the is your eternal a concept a philosophy a pantheon or a deity has an effect so if your eternal was a concept or a philosophy you get another channel faith action tied to your eternal you get another you get to pick a second domain tied to your eternal to gain the first tier benefit of so say you gave faith to the concept of life and death so you pick the life and death domains i i've made a sub list of domains life and death is on them you have life and death domains you picked life your level one you chose the life domain you are a life eternalist with this you would go okay i get the first tier feature of the death domain you also get resistance to your associated eternal's damage a single deity is very much the same um, you either pick the primary domain of your eternal if you're not following the primary domain or you pick a secondary domain if you're already following their primary domain you get a channel faith of that eternal you have to get the first tier of that selected domain and you get resistance to your eternal associated damage type pantheon is you instead of so whereas the others are pick another aspect of your eternal you are effectively delving into the mysteries of other facets of your eternal in the case of pantheon you are learning about a deity that is adjacent to yours so in the case of a pantheon say you had the goddess of death and their associated things were a god of war and a god of life you would either pick the god of war or the god of life you would get a channel faith action from that eternal you would still use your original um eternal's definition of chosen and nemesis but you would get access to this additional channel faith that you might not have access to for your normal deity you then select a first tier benefit of the primary domain of this adjacent eternal that you chose and you can select the associated damage type of the second eternal so whereas the other two is you get resistance to your eternal's damage type how this works is any time you would get to go i deal this much damage or i do this thing with damage of my eternal you can select to swap it with the damage type of your second eternal Apparently, this is you delving if you are in a pantheon you can choose to focus on just your eternal at which point you get the singular deity effect it's basically a ooh, it's basically a you choosing thing 
you get a feat. Fifth level, um, you can spend your short rest activity to expend one use of channel faith and recover the use of a spell slot. So here we go, level five, superior channel. This is the big one. So any of your channel faiths will grow more powerful. So all the eternal ones you saw listed had superior channel here as a buffed effect. In your A chosen, which just healed creatures of the chosen creature type, is now in power chosen. So you pick multiple creatures who all gain HP. And if they were bloodied, they gain some shield, they gain some barrier points. And your turn nemesis turns to destroy nemesis, which means not only do you frighten them, you now also deal damage to them at the same time. Yeah. You, you could choose to be an Eternalist who, if you're using Critical Role's Pantheon, is a pri your primary Eternal is the World Mother, and you could gain aspects of the Law Bearer because they are associated together. And then you would pick a, th a second deity that you would also potentially be able to pick from. Um, seventh level is basically your damage buff, Oh yeah, sixth level. So like all subclasses, you can either start a new domain or you expand one you already have. You should always, you can only ever pick domains associated with your eternal. The exception being the primary domain if you're a pantheon of your associated uh, deity. Because it didn't make sense to limit a, the Eternalist, like everyone else has had their subclasses open up. It didn't make sense to limit the Eternalist too much. So it makes sense that like, say you're dealing with, we'll use Critical Role again, the Raven Queen. You could go with Death, but you can also go with Fate. Because they are both as they're both domains tied to the Raven Queen. One's the primary, one will be a secondary, but you are exploring aspects of that deity. Uh, so yeah, Eternal Strike is basically a bonus to cantrip and weapon damage. It's basically this and the Path of Faiths have taken stuff out of the subclass, put them into the main class, because then it means that the subclass is devoted to being interesting and exploring a facet of your faith compared to this where it's just here's a damage buff um and yeah you either deal extra rated damage or you deal damage associated with your eternal then your path expands at level nine because level eight's a feat so if you pick the Path of Battle, which is where you got weapons and armor proficiency, well, good news, you can now use Intuition for your attack and damage rolls. Um, you also, when you hit level 9, get to pick a second path. So you could choose to go, I'm going to be Path of Battle, so I get weapons and armor proficiency, and I get to use my Intuition, and I'm going to pick the path of... Uh, what would you pick? We'll go path of magic. So you just get more spells. Uh, I'm going to be all the spells, all the combat, all the time. Uh -huh. uh, so path of hearing. So you already had the right of hearing before. You then get the commune spell. Uh, sorry, the commune ritual prepared. Uh... And it doesn't count against the number of spells you can prepare. You replenish uses. Uh, oh, and Path of Hearing lets you replenish your channel faith on a short rest. Path of Knowledge is if you make a trait test using an Eternalist skill. Uh, you can add your intuition to the skill bonus for the trait test. So for there, 
I don't think, hold on. So what it basically means, the, the reason for that is it means, so class features. These skills here, so like cosmology, you would add your knowledge, your skill bonus, and your intuition. Perception, you would add your intuition, your skill bonus, and your intuition again, because technically the intuition is a bonus to your skill bonus. Um, it means you're rather good at those skills. Path of Magic is you get extra spells to prepare, and you can add your intuition to the damage dealt by cantrips. If the cantrip already adds your intuition, you don't get to... Oh no, you do add it again, sorry. I did do that. You do get to add it again. And then Path of Ritual is you get another right, and you have advantage on trait tests performing a right or ritual. I may use intuition instead of a different trait chosen because rights are uh, base uh, rights are party challenges so you everyone has to propose a trait and a skill that they're going to use towards the goal what this does is say doesn't matter the skill you use you always get to use your intuition because you have dedicated yourself to being really good at rituals uh, more domain at level 10. Intervention, it's the, it's the same as divine intervention. 13th level, continued progress. You get to pick a third path. Um, and your eternal strike feature does 2d8 damage. 14th level, final domain. 15th level, you get another thing based on if your thing is a concept, a pantheon, or a deity. So if it's a concept or philosophy, you can increase the additional domain you chose to tier 2, or pick another domain to be tier 1, and you gain the benefit of a fourth path of faith. Um, so if you go down the concept philosophy route, you will get four paths of faith. So you could be a battle, knowledge, magic, ritual if you want it, but you have to pick a concept or philosophy. If you go a single deity, you get two extra uses of channel faith, and you can increase your additional domain to tier two, or choose a different domain of your, de of your deity to tier one. And Pantheon is, you can increase your connection to the prior chosen deity. So if you did Wild Mother and pick the Law Bearer, you expand your connection, they get the tier two of their primary domain. Or you can connect a second deity, gaining all the benefits of the expended connection feature, which means you get three associated damage types to choose from for your class features. You get the first tier of an additional primary domain, and I think you get to pick an extra channel faith. So... Panth Pantheon is kind of nice, kind of cool, but Pantheon kind of only works if your world has a Pantheon. Uh, single deity is very much like at this point. You really want to hone down. You want you want more channel faith uses. Concept or philosophy. Concept or philosophy is fun. I want to see what people do with that one. Um, then you get enough feet. Seventeen richest aura when taking part in a rite that is from the eternal list you and your allies can use your intuition instead of their normal trait and you can use the aid action once per trait test uh, to assist another individual with a party challenge want of faith at 18th uh, if you roll initiative without any use of channel faith you regain a use of channel faith 20th level, your divine intervention gets a buff. Uh, you also gain the Heaven Touch template. If you already have the template, gain another feature. Because the fun thing of the Heaven Touch template, and it's one of the reasons I wanted to give it, is the default template effect is you get a companion given to you 
by your Eternal, who acts as like a guide and messenger. So that's just like a fun roleplay effect. So that is the Eternal. Lots of magic. Lots of weird effects. Lots of playing with subclasses. Um, it's a weird, it's a weird class, but I kind of, I kind of love it. Um, the main problem I'm having is it was very easy to come up with domains because all I had to do was go back to mythology and go, right, what are they gods of? What are they gods of? And here's the problem. It's really easy to come up with a list of domains. I've got about 20 domains. The reason there are 20 domains where most other classes get six subclasses, though, is because, one, the Eternalist class features demand multiple domains. Secondly, a lot of your variance when you're a fighter is what weapon do you use, what combat steps do you pick. Your subclass is kind of like extra flavour, but you customise it in that. With the wizard... Your wizard was about 10 subclasses, but that's because you've got about 10 schools of magic. And the principle behind the wizard subclasses is, sorry, the arcanist subclasses is, it's one per spell school. Most other classes have six. I think warrior actually does get towards 10, which kind of has this, imp this, this implication that, like, the pillars, the cornerstones of the different kind of class types are going to have a lot of subclasses. It isn't deliberate. It's just... Arcanist needed one for every spell school. Fighter needed some for some variants of fighting style. The Eternalist needs them because if you pick six, we'll say six, There are far too many types of deity than six. <laughs> like, what would I go for? Like, you go, what if we go Greek myth, you at Nice need. Zeus is the god of the sun. Here is the god of marriage. Festus the god of make construction. Aphrodite is the god of love. Athena and Ares get to be god of war. That's your six. I can swap some out and put some in, like, take out Hephaestus, because he's kind of... He's not cared about too much in the mythology. We'll put in, like, Apollo, god of the sun. But he's also the god of music, and, you know, you get stuff like this. So, I did 20, partially because I'm running a FF14 uh, inspired Strixhaven. So part of what I needed gods to cover in their domains was, what do the gods of FF14 the gods of? Um, so the domains we are working on are <clears throat> the Bond Domain, Crafting Domain, Death Domain, Destruction Domain, Fate Domain, Half Domain, Knowledge Domain, Law Domain, Life Domain, Magic Domain, Moon Domain, Sea Domain, Space Domain, Storm Domain, Sun Domain, Time Domain, Travel Domain, Trickery Domain, War Domain, Wild Domain. So I think I've covered most of the bases there. So Bond gets to cover things like love, friendship, community, crafting, ease... You know, it's all the deities of the forge, of building, of construction. Death is very specifically death. It is the act of dying and passing to the afterlife. I'm very clear on this. Uh, destruction is about breaking things. But one of the key things is it's about breaking things in order for new things to be and better things to be built from it. Fate is fate. Hearth is the home. It is the family. So you kind of have some ties to bond, but it's kind of a very specific thing. Uh, probably going to be tied to rests. Knowledge, 
learning, teaching, or that law, justice, order. Probably going to lean more towards law and justice over order, which might mean you have a bit of vigilante uh, to allow for, like, your vigilante characters. Uh, life is life, healing, restoration. Uh, magic is magic. They're, they're gods of magic. In a world where there is magic, you've kind of got to have a god of magic. Uh, the moon... The moon and the sun and the stars are weird because, depending on your culture, depends what that means. How I am interpreting the moon is the moon is the deity of being the light that stands against the darkness. They are about purity and driving off evil. If that makes sense, I'm kind of a metaphor. Um, the sea is the sea, so they are deities of fishermen, sea travel, etc., etc. Uh, space, your gravity, your the you are the forces of space. Um, Technically, most deities go space and time, but I felt like space and time could be split in half. I feel like those are two very different mechanical points to play with. Um, storm is about the... The sea is about the water beneath a boat. The storm is about the weather above the boat. So really, it's the weather domain, but storm sounds cooler. <laughs> and usually... They're called God of the Storms, not God of Weather. Uh, sun, heat, light, potentially harvest, can kind of go a bit harvesty, depends. Time, it's time, don't need to describe that one. Travel, travel and half are weird because, in theory, they. You, you partially sit there, you look at it, and you go, these don't feel like D&D adventurer subclasses. They make sense in the world, because in the world you definitely need a deity that looks over travel, you know, who merchants and sailors and all that lot heavily worship for a safe travel with no bandits and no weird weather. And the half is the same with the protection of the home and the family. But I feel for an adventuring party, they're also important. Your hearth is where you rest for a long rest or a short rest. When you travel, you travel all over the show. You probably want to be on good graces with the deity of travel. Because if you don't, the deity of travel is going to come over and go, so here's some bandits, and here's some more bandits, and here's a dragon. Um... Trickery domain, everyone likes a bit of Loki. Loki's like the biggest offender for the reason that they got uh Um War Yes, I'm in yes, pop culture does demand that Loki and the God of War game are acknowledged somewhat in the fact that these two have been chosen. I've not I've not watched Loki and I've not played God of War, but you know, they're fundamental because fundamentally, trickster deities and war deities are like a thing. And then wild, it's nature, animals. You're not a druid, but you worship nature. Uh, so what have I done so far? Well, you see, I've written this lovely list, this beautiful list of 20 demands. And I think between them, I've covered most of the things. Like, in theory, I can add more over time. That is the point of a game designer. You can add shit over time. But this gives a nice basis. This gives enough domains that you can build a pantheon of five, six deities, each getting about two, three domains, maybe with some overlapping each other. Cool. Yeah, great. The problem is, and I've had this problem before with some others, 
it's very easy for me as a game designer to go, narratively, this is what we need. This is the narrative. Mechanically, I have no fucking clue how I'm going to make this work. Um, so here's what we've got so far. We've got the Bond domain. And you'll notice that uh, there's a lot of comments on the side by myself. And that's because uh, what I've basically done is copy and pasted a uh, battle channeler subclass. So all of these, say, Knight Errant to the Dream and stuff, that's because all of these have copy and pasted the, the layout of a battle channeler at the moment. I have, I have a few rough ideas. I don't have much. So my current thoughts on Bonderman is uh the first tier so level one you get an ability uh where i'm thinking maybe you can use empathy to remove the frightened or charmed condition from someone uh and then giving them another thing where during a long rest uh, sorry, once per long rest, so once per day, you get a free use of a shared bond concept or a concept, uh, the concept that lets you share uh, an action together. Um, basically, um, the, 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 the idea is like you the bond domain is playing the bond domain is kind of a mechanics first one in that this game is all about bonds this game has bond concepts and these concepts formed from your interactions with others that have affected you as a personality so the bond domain is about pulling on these bonds working together so their spells, their magic, the Eternals tied to them are about forming communities, um, being there to look over relationships, weddings, marriages, that kind of thing. Mechanically, though, we have this mechanic of bonds, which is going to play with. Um, there may be second tier getting a bonus to empathy roles and social roles. Uh maybe using channel faith to let you get some of the bond effects without having a mark of fate um then third tier being like because normally when you spend a mark of fate you only get one bond shared bond concept effect maybe letting you go for you you get to pick two um and one of the key things being early on it's going to be you get bonuses for calling upon your bonds but then as it goes down you as you get more powerful through this con through this um domain you get to do things like your allies you're bonded to also get to use these effects back on you um and like the biggest one being uh people you are bonded to can then do it to other people not tied to you if that makes sense crafting domain is the only one i've made spell lists ignore the spell lists because i haven't actually worked out what spells are going into the game so the spell lists are kind of a bit they're a bit dumb at the moment because we don't actually know what spells we're using um well the entire point of the game is the bonds you make are magical and have an impact it's just there is now a domain that is caught the the domain kind of shines a spotlight on this mechanic going this is important and this is important to me um so the crafting one is the one we've actually written even though i haven't written a crafting system i was able to come up with a crafting mechanic so uh, with a crafting subclass so this isn't just about deities to do with the forge this is any deity about artistic endeavor and creation this is gods of 
building structures, building items, building works of art, whatever you're making, this this is kind of tied to it. So what this is, is you get one artisan tool that you are trained in the use of. When you make a trait test, part of crafting an item using an art really i should just say crafting rather than craft an item uh um maybe if they're to do with building things then yes um they may also come under the law domain because law is often seen as a point of civilization. But they could also be half bond, just being a very large community. Depends. Um, so when you use a trait test, using uh, as part of crafting, using an artisan tool you're trained in the use of, you can use your intuition instead of the normal trait. It's a very simple thing. It's a very small thing, use intuition instead of another thing. What it does is it makes intuition useful for you. And you can use an artisan tool as a holy symbol. Uh, then also at first level, you, if an item has a gem slot. Now this hasn't been something we've really discussed, but. An idea I have for items is you have items and they have all their effects, but they also have a number of gem slots. And they'll be of different sizes. And you can put a gem in to give an additional effect. If you have the lowest level of gem slot three or higher, it's just if it's higher, obviously this is taking up the slot of something rather useful. Um in a tool, a weapon, an armor, or a shield, you can imbue that gem slot with your holy power. You can only do one. You can only maintain one of these at once. And if it's armor or shield, it gets a plus one hit target bonus. The item gets a plus one item bonus. And if it's a weapon, it gets a plus one bonus to attack rolls and damage rolls. Then second level is you increase the maximum number of soul bonds. So how many items you could use in D&D rules attuned to by one. And during a short or long rest, you can place your magic along with your talents into reinforcing a weapon or piece of armor and permanently give the weapon, the silvered weapon property, or the armor piece, the reinforced armor property, it does still cost half, half the amount of resources, which I believe is 100 GP. So it will still cost you 50 gold pieces, but that's still 50 gold pieces of equipment to perform the right. And like, you don't have to find a smith that knows how to do it, and silver, it's just, no, you just need 50 gold pieces of supplies for the rights. Uh, and you magically make it so with your uh, deity or faith or concept, whatever. Guided craft. Um, when crafting a project, the tote and you roll for the crafting progress. Um, oh, sorry. The amount of crafting progress you need to complete a project as an eternal of the crafting domain, it is halved. If you get to tier three. So effectively. For. In plain speak. Your crafting takes half the amount of time. And whenever you gain an inspired event. During trait, trait tests for crafting. You double your intuition. You, you take your intuition. You double it. And immediately add it to the crafting progress. On top of whatever you roll. Uh, and your imbue essence can now buff. So you still... So the plus one bonus is still a plus one bonus. What you can do is you can maintain two... Two or three, depending on your level, at once. 
but any one item can only have one of these holy gemstone slot fills. So if you wanted to buff your armor, you could give yourself a plus three to your hit target, but you'd have to pick three different bits of armor with gem slots open. There's a lot of different crafting things I've been working on across different things, like I made a feat for cooking, which had implications of how the crafting system works. Slowly, I am like circling the concept of a crafting system. I just am really procrastinating around actually writing a crafting system. I should probably write a crafting system, but I don't want to write a crafting system, if that makes sense. Which is bad, because in my document there is a section called Magic Item Crafting System. I just, yeah, I look at it and I go, I don't want to write it. Don't want to do it. Not now. Well, I'll do it later. Because I'm a fool. I'm a fool. But anyway, uh, and then your master, your, your final, if you go all four subclasses into Crafting Domain, it's you get a second bonus to your achievements. So you get uh effectively plus two attunements than normal you may choose one set of armor uh, a collection of armor pieces of the same armor type that you are wearing but is incomplete and you gain the benefits of that armor set without requiring all of the pieces like so yeah that that's crafting and then there's deaf domain which is another one that i'm procrastinate that i've kind of got on my ideas but i haven't written up yet um deaf domain looks like it is very much going to be a um uh, as a servant of a deity or concept of death you end up being a psychopomp so it's like you can see ghosts, you can communicate with ghosts, even those that others cannot see. And like you can either open a gate to your eternal's realm of death to like let them pass on. Or you can make a bargain with them to keep them around a bit longer. And basically you get some soul points that then you can use to perform death based effects. Um, so it's, um, yeah, basically you get a load of stuff you can do with ghost points. Uh, Tanif could theoretically, because we don't, yeah, we don't have a, I, I would say if, if we were to do it, I would probably go with, you might consider Tanif being a bard under the new system but using 5e's version of the college of spirits using the 5e college of spirits but with the new bard and potentially multi-classing into cleric and maybe going down the death domain um potentially uh, or you could go entirely down the death domain the advantage bard has is i believe bard now you get to pick your spell casty i did do that didn't i where is it arcane potential yeah you get to pick so you could totally go i'm going to be a bard cleric multi-class and go uh, intuition as your spell casting for both. It's probably not the most optimal multi class because there are things like um, you wouldn't really get any benefit of cosmic bolt or eternal bolt because they both 
really need other classes when multi-classing to get their effect. But you would still get some pretty cool effects out of it. Uh... Potentially. It very much would depend. The death domain is very much a you... I'd say it would fundamentally change Tanif because it would turn Tanif from someone who can see ghosts to someone who is more, you're more psychopomp. Your job is not just to see ghosts, but to help them move on to the other side, if that makes sense. You're, you're, you... The Death Domain is very much you are the Grim Reaper, your jaw, or the Thanatos um, of Greek myth. Your job is to go, well, you just died. I'm going to just open this door and you can push, push you through to the other side kind of thing. Um, whereas if you just wanted to see ghosts and stuff. It would probably be very much like it is now a you would be a bard use this system's bard use college of sorcerer college of sorcery and yeah you, you just go college of sorcery maybe make a buff that lets you see ghosts as like an extra little flavorful feat or something but yeah college of, i'm not sure college of death would suit tanif just because it would be a fundamental change in the character uh to a psychopomp um But for those who want to play that kind of psychopomp, that kind of, I want to help usher, I want to be the character that helps usher people onto the, you know, whenever you slay an opponent at the end of a fight, you're the kind of cleric who goes, I want to give everyone here last rites. But Death Domain would totally be in your, um, in your thing. Psychopomp, yeah. It's, uh, it's the term used for any character like a Grim Reaper or Thanatos, the, the character that new stuff over. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very specific play for the Death Domain. Um, this is the domain that's been giving me shit. Destruction. I have no idea what to do for destruction. <laughs> like, it very easily goes, you do damage, and it's like, cool. That's boring. <laughs> I, I don't know what to do. This is the thing. I can come back to these ones where I've kind of planned it and go, okay, we can actually write this. Because I've now had the inspiration. I now just need to wait for the second wave of inspiration. Probably when there is less heat looking up at the sky demon, the demonic sky orb of heat and radiation in the sky. And... Uh, Yeah, I'm I'm not sure with destruction. Cause it's very easy always just to go, Oh, you can just do damage to stuff and it's like, yeah, but that that isn't so much fun. Um, I could maybe include like a fluffy thing where it's like, Oh yeah, you're really good at breaking objects. The problem is with rules like that, they're not useful until they are useful, and often then they're useful because they're breaking the game in some way. Can I just say, the sun is starting to set and I can already feel the drop in temperature and it is beautiful. I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> As someone who hates the sun, this is this is beautiful. Just the, the sudden drop in temperature is lovely. Um, yeah, so destruction is where I'm currently struggling. Fate, I'm slightly struggling. 
Um, Because it's the age-old problem of there's already a divination wizard. How do how how do I do it differently? So I can't, I've got to lean into the the prophecy. Um, oh, you need to lean into the prophecy kind of oracle stuff. It's just how to do that mechanically. Age-old problem of it's really easy to say. Yeah, let's have a god of fate. But then it's like you sit there going, what the fuck is the mechanics for a god of fate? Um, yeah, the problem is with destruction, there aren't... Weirdly enough, there are not that many gods of destruction. It, that one is very much an FF14 thing. Uh, there's a deity called Raulgar the Destroyer. That, that, that's literally his title is he's the destroyer like he's all about um his his symbol is a meteor and he's all about lightning and fire and he his priests tend to all be monks the the, the class not the not the religious profession Uh, so yeah, it's a bit... As I look, there is Shiva. There is Beerus from Dragon Ball. Kali Araman This is the problem. Everything goes to destruction equals death, and it's like, well, because mm, because the line we go with here is where it's the. Uh, the, yeah, you must have a you must have a wildfire to replenish the soil, for then new crops to grow. Uh, the river has to burst its banks to replenish the land. Uh, a mountain must be eroded for a valley. Uh, a system of government must be destroyed for a new system of government, a better system of government to take place when it's failed. Etc. Etc. Um, that that's kind of the the philosophy behind the deities is, um, they are about destroying a system to build a new system. Um, problem is a lot of things that will do those things are spells <laughs> so i kind of have to think about what mechanics can you do tight and i could definitely go down the route that some D, &D subclasses do where it's like if you do if you cast a spell of x thing you get to buff its effect and it's like okay but what if What if that isn't very helpful in the nicest regards? What if... It, it can be very easy to go, let's have an effect that buffs damage. But that isn't always like oh uh, 
And the other problem is if I just give it combat effects. Oh, the problem is I have to be mindful that if I give it combat effects, it might be competing with the war demand. This is the problem. This is one of the ones where I'm like, these things could compete. Because with the sun, yes, I can do stuff with fire damage, light damage, but that's an aspect. That's very specific. A uh, storm would deal with thunder and lightning damage. Destruction kind of needs to not be tied to a damage type, which is fine. It just needs to be about breaking things. And again, the main problem there is that's a lot of um, spells. Uh, I imagine a lot of things will be like shape earth, um, control fire, control water, things like that. Uh, any effect that does any spell that does funky elemental effects, basically. Um, I would end up going with that kind of thing. <sighs> I want to pin this one down though because then it helps me understand the other ones. Kind of, it's the thing I can compare the others to. The other thing I have to be mindful of is if I'm going down the damage type, I can't focus too much on damage magic because that then starts to compete with the evocation wizard i do want to have some level of combat focus but i kind of need to be very careful about how we do it it almost has to like have the problem. The problem is that even if we go with metaphorical, the, the, the problem here is trying to convert narrative into mechanic. Um, converting narrative into mechanic that in itself is a satisfying mechanic. You want like with the crafting cleric, its thing is there's a bunch of stuff where it's like, listen, if you're playing with a crafting system, we just want you to be better at playing with the crafting system. If you're not playing with the crafting system, we still have a couple of effects that just help making your armor and your weapons better. Like really, three of the effects don't care about the crafting system. Two of the effects care about the crafting system. The other three kind of dance around it and give you some freedom and flexibility with the general equipment system. Um, so I've kind of... Uh, we already give you a cantrip bonus. You get up to about 2d8 damage of your associated de uh, Eternal's damage type whenever you cast a cantrip. So already cantrips are getting a combat buff. Are your weapons, if you take path of battle and go far enough, will be able to use your intuition. The 
Oui. A lot of it is going to be in the spells. We can maybe do something that lets you deal extra damage to objects. Or structures. Um... Maybe do something to buff the power of a combat spell. Evocation focuses on buffing cantrips, but we're already buffing cantrips as part of being an eternalist to begin with. So what you could do is you could do a general buff to damage spells. Do a buff to damage spells. Have one thing that gives a bonus to damaging objects. Have an ability at a low level that lets you... Ignore or reduce damage reduction. Then at higher levels, you can give something that ignores resistances. And then maybe as a capstone, you can ignore immunity, but only to your Eternal's chosen damage type. Um... So you have your first first level ability be a bonus to damage to objects with a secondary effect of ignore resistance by objects or individuals. Sorry, reduction, specifically reduction. Then you have a second first level skill, which will be something else. Then you have a second level skill that will... Your second level skill. Not sure about the second level. Your third tier skill would be a general buff to your damage spells. Maybe if you cast a spell that deals damage. You can add your intuition if the spell does not already add your intuition to the damage roll. Then your fourth tier would be you can use a channel, a use of channel faith to ignore resistances to the spell that you cast. And if the damage type is the damage type associated with your eternal, you can also ignore immunity. That'd be quite an interesting capstone. Do we want to tie it to channel faith, though, or do we want to make it independent? It might be slightly more fun to have it independent, because then it still leaves your channel faith open for other effects. Such as using channel faith to change the damage type to be that of your uh, eternal chosen damage type. Um, still need a second tier effect. Hello, is that Cronadal? Hey, Cronadal, let me give you a shout out. Oh dear. Ronald is an awesome, cool person. 
who everyone should give a follow because uh hold, hold on it's done let's see if that's how it works is that how it works yes that's how it works uh could be damage reflection maybe mm. Object. Let's say tier three, we let you Yeah, yeah, you could do that, actually. That might be interesting. Uh, ignore resistance to your spells. Uh, I am alright. I'm currently suffering under the heat of the sun. Um, and have been far too busy and have been been a little bit guilty about uh, damage to target's armor rather than hit points would be interesting. Yeah, theoretically. Um, yeah, I've been feeling a little bit guilty because I have not been streaming much. Uh, but also, like, everything... Everything is a bit screaming. Um... Basically, I've taken a lot of responsibilities that have made the last few months busy. Um, which is really bad, because I want to stream some Stellaris now the new expansion's out. I want to try and stream more Harvestella. FF14, it's got its new patch out, though I have done most of the things for patch. But I like streaming FF14 with people. It's a nice, chill game. Oh, uh, we've got Pharaoh to stream. Hades. Uh, there are some other games I'm playing, but I'm not looking at the moment at streaming them. Valheim people generally have never been really interested in, especially because I tend to do it solo. Um, Age of Wonder 4 and Baldur's Gate 3 are mainly dooting about. I'm not actually doing them seriously at the moment. And uh, Dark Tide and Starship Troopers probably... Well, based off how Dark Tide went, uh, they did not stream well because they competed with OBS for my computer system, so <laughs> yeah yeah it's the other problem, streaming my laptop gets incredibly warm which then means my, war my room increases in warmth like, playing games, my laptop increases in warmth. Playing games and streaming, my laptop definitely increases in warmth. Um, but... No, hopefully after the next few weeks, um, I'll be able to pick back up again. Because I think it's about... Next week is half term, and then I've got three more college sessions on a Tuesday then my evening classes are finished until autumn um, next week is UK Games Expo which will be yeah I'm not uh, just as a warning folks 
for about Thursday, I am going to be doing Jackal with this channel. I'm going to be UK Games Expo enjoying myself and meeting other games designers. So, oh, yeah, I like Stellaris. The main problem is it takes so much time, especially because I get into it. And the next thing I know, it's 9 p.m. and I've got work in the next morning and I'm sat there going, shit. Um. Like, it's not too bad, it's just, it's a lot. <laughs> Everything is a lot. I am not a teacher in real life. I am studying in night classes because I am trying to uh, get better jobs, which does mean I have to do some... Uh, I have to do some uh, night classes... No, I am unfortunately a worker of local in local government, which is like the most boring. Uh, it's not boring. That's the wrong word. It it is somewhat stressful because you are very much overworked, underpaid for the amount of work that they make you do, and uh, at least the job I do. Uh, is, it is uh, accelerated multiple parts of my body falling apart, primarily my back. <laughs> uh, I am trying to study IT stuff because uh, I completely uh, screwed up university, so I did not get a degree out of it, so I'm having to try and get other qualifications to get into the industry. Um, Hey-ho, all good fun. Yeah, I don't do an off... I am a half-office job. Uh, I specifically work with the library service, so I am picking up and carrying around boxes of books. And the problem is books are heavy when in a box, and the boxes, they, the boxes our suppliers use are not very large, not always held together properly due to the weight of the books. Some of them break. And, uh, yeah, a lot of the bending down and up to pick up these boxes of books causes uh, damage on the spine. Or, as I heard fun on Wednesday, uh, I bent down, my knees decided to then start hurting. So I had to finish by leaning, which you should never do, never lean when you're picking things up, which then hurt my back. <laughs> Yay! Oh yeah, uni was pushed on me way too fucking early. Yeah, I wish I had an office job. Then my back, my knees, and everything else would probably still give me grief, but they would give me less grief, because I wouldn't be adding to the suffering. I'd only be suffering for my sins that I have previously committed. I only would have to pay for the sins of the past over the sins of the present. Or, you know, I could get a hybrid working job, which then means I can spend some of my days lying, doing work on a laptop, but I'd be able to lie in bed, which then means I can support my body in a way that doesn't <laughs> hurt them. Like how I stream. <laughs> Because look about behind the curtain, basically because most of my flat is basically taken up by the bed. It's I have the laptop on a desk next to the bed. I am currently lying in bed, sat up. But what it does mean is my knees, I don't have to worry about the placement of my knees or my leg or my hip. Because they are all being supported by the bed. And then the back of the bed and then the headrest for the bed is supporting my back which means my body is being supportive, I am not suffering, and I am not in pain. These are... <laughs> these are important things. Like, to be fair, it's probably not doing my neck any good or my wrists any good, but... Of the things that give me grief, my neck and my wrists have not given me grief. My knees and my back do, so... 
I'm prioritizing the bits that are broken over the bits that are not. Speaking of broken, <laughs> the destruction domain, let's continue. <laughs> Oh, God. Life as a millennial. Pain. So much fucking pain. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, speaking of pain, I'm still not over the emotional pain I experienced last night in D&D. &D. Oh. Now that was some emotional suffering. Everyone else in D&D &D had fun. They just got to watch the suffering. They were all like, yeah, it's a great session. I'm sat there screaming, going, no. You got to enjoy the suffering because you weren't living it. I was living it. Arborea, this is going to be a wonderful day because I'm going to find out all the secrets that I don't remember. Arborea, at the end of the day, I really did not want to remember these things. <laughs> no, to be fair, they did want to remember those things. It was important they remember those things. But it has taught the baby robot what vengeance and anger are. The, the baby robot has learned what anger, anger and vengeance is. Because they wish to carry it out. Uh, it's not too weird. I, it, it was interesting. I can very much tell our DM had uh, perhaps taken less. To be fair... A lot of this campaign feels like it's taken lessons from. So the DM of our D&D &D game was a fellow player alongside myself. And the other player of our, the other um, consistent player of our D&D &D game, the three of us were players in a Dresden Files uh, Fate TTRPG. Which included abilities like, you can see ghosts. Um, I think one of the char I think my ca yeah my character had the uh, you can see ghosts. Yeah, that was trash wizard. Um, but I can see a lot of inspirations. Um, to be fair, I can't really talk. This RPG takes some inspiration from stuff I, I learned and liked from that TTRPG. Uh, Dresden Falls was a very interesting campaign um, the most interesting things I think about it were oh, how to put it Dresden Falls was very interesting in how it handles magic um, say you're performing a ritual, it's very much a, there is a test involved, but it can be made easier and more likely to succeed based on the, uh, um, sympathetic magic. So like having things related to the target, having things that symbolically can be attached to the magic to the idea of the magic that you're wanting to perform makes the ritual easier which you could kind of see in the ritual last night where basically i went oh yeah we have these items that give us each a mental link to each other therefore they are the most appropriate symbolic item um yeah that dresden file game was very good and i think it had a lasting impact on actually quite a few of us who played it um, so what we have been working on, so um, last, so during the winter we did a 
we did a couple of projects. We did one which we need to get back to. Uh, probably after UK Games Expo, I'll go back to it, which was Surviving Winter, because we need to finish the random tables for that. Uh, we did a, a game jam for developing a game called Winter uh, Surviving Winter, which was about werewolves um, trying to survive through the winter. Hence the name. Um, the other thing we did was I started to toy around with the idea of could I make a version of 5th edition D&D that suited my weird proclivities and lessons and things I enjoy from different TTRPGs to kind of make a new TTRPG. Uh, then the OGL crisis happened, which caused some shenanigans and kind of kickstarted things. And then Wizards uh, announced that the uh, SRD was becoming Creative Commons. So since the winter, we have been... I'd say we, I have been designing a modified version of the 5th edition rule set. Uh, the way I, I would describe it is I have taken the Unreal Engine or the Unity game engine and I'm messing with it. The idea is that because I have supported a lot of third party um, D&D creators over the years and have got a number of resources from them, I don't want to design something that is incompatible with 5th edition, but I did want to design something that was, that took 5th edition, the bits I liked, and replaced the bits I didn't like with things that I have learnt from playing other games because i did not start playing dnd dnd wasn't even the first game i gm'd i've gm'd multiple other systems and played multiple other systems before dnd and so i'm taking those lessons and bringing them forward into this um, game system what we're currently doing is um taking is taking the classes and redes redesigning them so what we're working on today is uh, i did a brief overview of the eternalist which is our variant of the cleric and so we're now working on the subclasses at the moment i'm trying to not necessarily write the rules text but to kind of get the ideas of what i want each ability to be um I might release the... Because what I've done is I've released each of the things in a draft document. Uh, my, uh, it's much smaller Google Docs, because uh, if you went onto this master Google Doc, which is, what is that? 613 pages. Uh, Google breaks, if you try to view it on a mobile phone. Uh, to be fair, on PC, it likes to slow down. So... Uh, for the public, I have released uh, draft documents which are broken into pieces. So what I uh, can do is, give me just a moment. Uh, let's see if I go onto that page. That should show me the document page. Here we go, the warrior class. Let me read more and link it. So here we go. I, I don't care. So that is... Uh, the the Ko-Fi post has a link to the master folder and the um, Google Doc link. That one's for the warrior, but the, the folder has access to all of them. What I might do is I might release the Eternalist with just the crafting one so that people can see that to refer to um, and then I'll work on the others my hope was I'd have a bit more ready for UK Games Expo but uh, it is not the case but I'm taking my time with each one um, 
it's been very interesting seeing uh, the one D and D play test and Cobalt Press's Tales of the Valiant, and seeing how each of them have kind of looked at the same thing I have, which is what's fifth edition's problems, and we've all gone in completely different directions. Um, fair. Uh, I am not promoting my game's design. Uh, I just have never been to UK Games Expo. And it's probably good to like have a brief portfolio of things you've done in the past. Um, also, theoretically, I might be able to get some people to sit down and do some character creation and see if they like the basic principles. Um, there is only one kind of official networking I'm doing, which is, is it the Friday or Saturday night? I'm going to a games designer networking event held at the expo, so. But by that, I know some different UK TTRPG designers who I've met on Twitter, so I will probably, um, if they have stores, I'll go check out their stores. If they don't have stores, I'll probably try and meet up and say hi. Um, and I have agreed foolishly Someone was like, oh, I need some people to run some games. Like, I can run some systemless horror games. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to be running some systemless horror, theoretically, uh, on the Saturday. If uh, anyone's at UK Games Expo. I don't know why I did it, but I did it. Oh, dear. I am a fool. A fool. But yes, um, but no, partially I wanted things done for the UK Games Expo because otherwise it's meant I will have spent nearly six months writing this stuff. To be fair, I've not been doing too bad up until, I think up until Eternalist, it had been taking me about one to two weeks. It was like, it took, it was generally, it took me a week to write a core class. And then theoretically another week or half a week to write the subclasses. And then Turnless came and I got incredibly busy. Slash I keep looking at the subclasses going, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but yes. But what we have written is basically the core rules. Uh, though the core rules are always subject to change as I go, actually, I should do this based off this design. Um, Warrior, which is our version of Fighter. Bard, which is our version of Bard. Battle Channel, our version of Barbarian. Arcanist, our version of Wizard. I think that's it. Yes. And then I'll probably post a turn list very soon. And then once I've done the eternal list, I want to do Pact Bound, which is our version of Warlock, and World Speaker, which is our version of Druid. Which are going to be fun. And I am terrified of the World Speaker because the World Speaker is the one where I know what I want to do. I have no idea how I'm going to make it work. Pack bound is just going to require a lot of work. Um, and then it's the half casters, which is half casters, rogue, and monk. Oh, and also, I need to do the scion. I need to do the scion class. Yeah, I've got stuff to do. Um, but yes, right. At the very least, I want to be able to get this. Because once I've got past destruction, it should be like... Whoosh. Yeah, this... I'll be honest, I did not expect games... Uh, redesigning an entire game system to be uh, a quick or easy endeavour. My main problem was just I was hoping at least I could get a bit more done. But as I said, I've just been hitting the roadblock with the subclasses and with um, 
union and other bits taking up more time than I expected. Um, uh, I'll, I'll briefly talk about what I'm going to do with Pat, ba Pat Bound. Uh, so Warlock, because I know people love their Warlocks, uh, is still going to be a spellcaster that recharges on a short rest. You will have more spell slots than you currently do. Uh, yeah, you have more spell slots than you currently do because you eventually end with eight spell slots. You then have Eldritch slots, um, which are... Eldritch spell casting is a replacement of Mystic Arcanum. And that's your high-level spell slots. And then you get your Eldritch Invocations. Um, currently, what's changing? Um, there's going to be Pact to the Blade, which is like Pact to the Blade now. Pact to the Chain, like Pact to the Chain now. Pact to the Tome, like Pact to the Token now. Pact to the Token, Pact to the Cauldron. Token... I'm not entirely sure yet. I I keep thinking back to a Dresden campaign, to the Dresden campaign we did, and I want to think about things you can do with tokens. I'm like half going. I want to do some stuff of using it as a spell casting focus, but also you can use this token as like give someone a give someone your token and suddenly like if you do a ritual to blow up x target suddenly having the token on the person you want to target makes it really effective i'm not quite sure yet i need to think about that one and patch the cauldron is basically you can make potions um I don't have much thoughts beyond that. I've just kind of... though Those few things have been the few things I've felt about at the moment. Warlock didn't have a lot of class features, so I've got to kind of think about it. Um, push still the Eldritch Invocations. And the big... And uh, the packs at the moment, because I was just thinking what things can you make a deal with in the different realms. Archfey for the Realm of the Fae, Ancient Artifact, Death Lord for the Realm of Death, Deep One for the Outside, no, Outside of the Outside, Deep One for Things from the Sea, Draconic Eternal Fragment. Which was Fragment? Oh, I know what Fragment was. Um, Mass Evil Outsider Titan. I should probably add... Elder Spirit for the Dream. I'll come back to that one. I'll think about it. Um, yeah, but you'll probably want to add something from the Dream. And then all of the realms are represented. Go to the shops. Do the thing. It has cooled down. Will the shop still be... Yeah, some shops will still be open, I guess. Do the shop thing. Do the self-care. If you have meds, make sure you take your meds. Get up. Have a stretch. Have a walk. Have a drink. Get a snack. If you need to go to the shops, go to the goddamn shops. Oh, yes, I remember Big Tesco. Oh, those were the days, Big Tesco. Far end of Jar's Gate. Um, yeah, those were good times. Yeah, no, it was midnight, yeah. Oh, I remember those late night walks. The sun would set, it was night time, so it was a cold air breeze. Oh, those were good. But it's been a long time since I've been a uni student. <laughs> a long time since I got to enjoy that freedom. Um, I don't have to be responsible and go to bed at a reasonable time. 
otherwise the world hates me um yeah and then world speak uh world speak was even less um it will probably be wild shape is an optional feature um you would get a choice between being wild shape again probably another potion making thing and then i think maybe giving you the option of an animal companion um that acts like find familiar but also it's an animal companion um because that adds a nice through fare for ranger because one of the things is like there's a through fare for each with the paladin you're kind of getting the channel faith from the eternalist both ranger and world speak will get the option to have an animal companion but then they both have options to do other things instead Does it make me think what I should do for to keep a through fare between wizard and lawmaster? Hmm. That's something I'll worry about after. Um That's entirely fair. That is very fair. Right. I okay. Let's 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 focus. Let's try and get this done. Um, because I did say today was going to be a short stream. So what I want to do is I want to get this feature done, and then I think we will call it for the day. So we need one more destruction thing. Um. So we're giving damage reduction, damage object, degrade armor. Let's have a thing. Destruction, destruction. Let's Do have a renewal effect. I'm not sure what it's going to be yet. But I think I want something I want to start off with something that encourages renewal. Okay. Right, I think that is we've done quite a lot today. So I'm very quickly just going to do something a second. Give me just a moment. A little, 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 little. Okay, let's go. Let's see. Let's see who's live. I want to spread the love. Let's share the love. See who's live. Um. Apex or Destiny Two. What do people think? Apex Legends or Destiny 2? Does anyone have a preference? If no preference, I will go with the person with the least viewers. That way to share the most love. Uh, 
Okay, let's go raid Captain Faithful doing some Apex Legends. So, I would like to thank everyone for coming, everyone for joining. Hopefully we'll do some streams this week. Maybe, I don't know. We'll see how we're doing for time. It is a bank holiday this weekend, so I might try and do some Monday streams. No promises. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for joining. You are all awesome and amazing. Do check out Chronodile. Awesome, amazing streamer. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you.